Welcome. Good evening, brothers and sisters. It's a great pleasure to have been invited here to the Islamic Society of York Region and to add my voice to all those voices raised in appreciation of the legacy of the Ayatollah Khomeini. I was just in Syria a few weeks ago. Com compare that the way, the honorable way, the correct way that Ayatollah Khomeini treated and respected Jews and Christians with the fact that these takfiris come into communities, they're paid for by the Saudi government, they're armed by the United States, they come in and they destroy, uh, they take over, they occupy whole cities or whole sections of cities, they kill, uh, they kill Christian and, and uh, even Muslim religious leaders, they behead people in the streets, they, um, they butcher people and eat organs, um, they, they destroy monuments, they destroy convents, they destroy churches, they, they destroy mosques. So the difference between them and the, uh, uh, and the Wahhabi, uh, this deviant form of Islam that emanates from Saudi Arabia and the, the proper treatment, the proper Islamic treatment of, of people of other faiths could not be more clearly demonstrated than by the practice of the Ayatollah Khomeini towards the Jews of Iran. So that is another legacy of uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini. The last thing I want to talk about is Syria, where I was, I just returned three weeks, from where I just returned three weeks ago. Um, under the Ayatollah Khomeini, there was an, an alliance built over some years uh, between Iran and, and uh, Syria. Um, it's, it started uh, during it started during the um, uh, Israeli invasion of uh, Lebanon when both Syria and, no it started actually during the war um, of uh, when Saddam Hussein was egged on with five billion dollars from the, the Arab oil states in the US to attack Iran. And Syria was actually one of the first countries to recognize the, gov the new government of Iran. Uh, and Syria was one of the few countries to side with Iran during that war. In 1982, uh, during the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, uh, Syrians and Iranians stood together uh, against the Israeli in invasion and they both encouraged the success of Hezbollah uh, in taking over the parts of the country that were occupied by the Zionist uh, invader. Uh, our, an axis of resistance was built uh, and the, the powerhouse of that axis of resistance in my opinion was Iran. Um, What's happened in Syria in the, in the last five years is uh, a U.S.-sponsored covert war of aggression against that country. What the U.S. wants from Syria, or what they don't like about Syria, is that it has a government uh, that's opposed to uh, Israel. Uh, it's, a, it's a government that has... Uh, restrictions on foreign capital coming in and foreign ownership. It's a government that, in, that has a role in the economy. None of these things make it uh, very favorable to the U.S. government. Um, so what they did, and I have to tell you the Canadian involvement in this, in uh, December 2011, the Harper government gave instructions to its ambassador in Tunisia to organize a pre-conference for the foundation of the so-called Friends of Syria group in Tunisia, in Tunis, in 2012. So the, the Harper government used Canada's diplomatic uh, expertise to organize a group of countries, including mostly native, NATO countries, plus certain Arab Gulf monarchies, to put their resources together to bring down the Syrian government. And that's where they brought in the, uh, they brought in these Takfiri militants, these, foreign, these mainly foreign terrorists 
who came into the country and uh, behaved in such a barbaric fashion. And over the period of five long years, close to now half a million Syrians have been killed, 11 million have been displaced, five or six million are internally displaced, three or four million are refugees in other countries. The country has been laid, the uh, civilian infrastructure has been laid waste, the, uh, the, the uh, economy has been ruined, um, the Takfiri militants uh, conduct all kinds of reprehensible uh, practices such as uh, seize, grabbing, uh, seizing young uh, Syrian boys and girls and women for the sex trade. Uh, they're engaged in the drug trade. And this has been going on for five long years. But it all changed last September 2015 when there was a Russian military offensive which changed the, the game on the ground, changed the situation on their ground. And it was accompanied by a, a diplomatic offensive from R Russia and from Iran which forced the USA to come to the uh, bargaining table back in Geneva and to restart the peace process for Syria. And so they signed a partial cessation of hostilities. And that's the condition on which, at which uh, our uh, solidarity mission, the second international uh, um, tour of peace to Syria, went into the country. When I went into the country, I had you know, some preconceived notions. And I thought that after five long years of war, the Syrian people would be downcast and depressed and pessimistic. But I was wrong. On the day that we arrived, the Syrian, Syrian people held an election. And this election was in defiance of the Western powers who said, no, you can't have an election, not until we finish this peace process. But the Syrians said, this is an exercise in national sovereignty. Our constitution of 2012 says we have to have an election every four years, and we're going to go ahead and have this election. And the people of Syria were adamant. They, they lined up at the polling stations, um, and they, polling stations had to be opened in Damascus till 11 o'clock at night to accommodate all of them. And I spoke to the people who came to the polling station. I said, why are you voting? And they said, it's our national duty. And I said, what difference do you think it will make in the world? And they said, we don't really care what the rest of the world thinks. We are de de going to determine our own future. We are going to pick our own government. This is our national destiny. This is our national sovereignty. And uh, on that day, uh, 140,000 Palestinian ref Syrian refugees recrossed the border from Lebanon just for the purpose of voting. It was, uh, they had a, uh, the American government dis uh, dismissed the, uh, the results of the election even before their votes were counted by saying it didn't represent the people. But the Syrian people in the, in the midst of a war with millions of people displaced and parts of the, a third of the country occupied by these foreign takfiris managed to come out with 58% turnout rate which is 10% better than the Americans ever manage in their own elections. And it's uh, better than most Canadian elections as well. So they were making a statement to the world that they're defiant and they're gonna, they uh, are not beaten in the least. On the fourth day, or no, on the fifth day, our last day in Syria, uh, we, got to go to, um, we got to go to the recently liberated town of Palmyra. You may have heard about that. It was an ancient Roman town, the, an oasis in the desert. It was called the Bride of the Desert. And when ISIS was, ISIS came 10 months before in convoys, open convoys across the desert, I'm told in broad daylight, and the um, US-led coalition didn't drop a single bomb or fire a single shot at them. And they came and they killed 200 Syrian soldiers and took the town. They blew up the temple of uh, two temples in the Roman town and the Arch of Triumph. The, the, they destroyed all, all the. Fortunately, the Syrian government had cleared out the museum and hidden, uh, removed all the treasures. But outside, there were some beautiful statues and columns, which the Takfiris took hammers to and, and uh, broke into small little pieces. The, the, the curator of the, of the site 
an 82-year-old man, refused to leave the town, and so they beheaded him and stuck his head on a pole for three days in the town square. This, this is how the barbarians, who are supported by the United States and Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Israel, uh, operate. And we went into the town, and to get to, into the town, you have to go, th to get to Palmyra, you have to pass through the new town of Todmor. And we were there the same day as the Russians and the, uh, and the Syrians allowed the inhabitants of the town to come back and to go through the rubble of their homes and pick out whatever they could get and bring it out. So when we arrived, there were buses and trucks all along the streets of uh, Todmore, and there were group family groups going into the into the town, in, uh, into the ruins of the broken buildings, um, and they were bringing out fridges, stoves, vacuum cleaners, carpets, children's toys, clothing, and piling them up on the sidewalk. And we, in the uh, in the uh, tour, were overwhelmed with pity for these people. And again, we were wrong, because. We decided to talk to uh, some of these people. We went over, we could talk to anyone we wanted to, and so we went over to one particular group of people, a family group going through their stuff on the sidewalk. And uh, one of our people said in Arabic, so how are you coping? And uh, the, old, the patriarch of the family looked up from his uh, sorting on the sidewalk and turned to us with a big smile and he said, we're doing great. Now that the Takfiri militants are gone, everything will be better. And he said, as for the ruins of this town, don't worry about it. We'll rebuild this town and it'll be twice as good as before. So this shocked us and it showed us the resilience of the Syrian people. And with, with friends, with, peop, with attitudes like that, those people can win. And it's my observation, my personal observation, this is the this is the pamphlet that I wrote, which was just published today, and uh, there are 20 copies now here in this mosque. It's my personal observation that the Russian government, the Iranian government, the Chinese government, and Hezbollah in Lebanon have drawn a red line around Syria. And they have determined that Syria cannot fall to these Takfiris to these terrorist, foreign-backed terrorist militants. Because if it were to fall, then the net, it would only be a short matter of time until these terrorists were at the gates of Beirut and Baghdad and Tehran and then Moscow and Beijing. So it's my opinion, my personal opinion, that, um, that these countries, Russia, China, Iran, uh, Hezbollah, are going to see to it that the people of Syria get back their national sovereignty, get back their territorial integrity, and win. So I think that the fact that the, that the, that the Iranian government has this close alliance and support for the, uh, for the um, Syrian government is, a, is another legacy of the Ayatollah Khomeini. I have to say um, uh, some words in memory of the third... Unfortunately, the, even though the Americans signed the deal for a partial cessation of hostilities, they have used this opportunity, the ceasefire, to rearm their, uh, their so-called moderate Syrian rebels who are really al-Nusra around uh, the uh, official Al-Qaeda franchise in Syria. And these, these uh, al-Nusra militants launched an attack recently on a village and captured a village where Iranian soldiers were stationed and 13 Iranian soldiers were killed just last week. So we should say a prayer for those soldiers. I want to, um, I want to say that um, I can't speak as to the global legacy of the Ayatollah Khomeini. I don't claim to know about the contributions he made to his Islamic thinking or many other aspects of his, his work. But as a Jew and as an anti-war activist, 
I can honestly say I greatly appreciate the contribution that the Ayatollah Khomeini has made to the modern world at this particularly dangerous time for humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you.